Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Tonight, again, uh, is, is meant to be some interesting information, I think some very relevant information, but we're all supposed to have a little fun. Because skiing is fun and snowboarding is a great time as well, but you want to try to avoid seeing me in my office. That's probably the number one uh, reason to, to uh, listen to this talk. And we're going to go through the goals of the presentation and then we're going to demonstrate it uh, in the middle. There some exercises and some yoga moves that I think will help you and we'll finish up with a question and answer period. So again, specifically, I want to raise your awareness of the common things that can happen with skiing or snowboarding. I want to briefly discuss the severe injuries, not to, not to scare you, but again, to hopefully prevent you from having a catastrophic problem on the slopes. We'll outline the causes of these in, in specific and in, in very good detail. And then we're going to move forward with presenting prevention tips, uh, again, in a specific manner. We'll demonstrate a little bit of that conditioning program and then finish with a Q&A. So skiing and snowboarding are very fun sports, but they're also dangerous. If you look at statistics across the country of how many injuries occur, it's about three injuries per thousand skiers or boarders each day on the mountain. And those injuries run the spectrum from minor sprains to paralysis or even death. So what we need to do tonight is try to understand what these injuries are, really delve into the causes of them, and then outline what prevention tips that are specific that may be helpful. The first thing we need to understand is there's a difference between skiers and snowboarders. And it's not just in how they dress or you know, where they like to ski or snowboard. So there's a lot of evidence to suggest that skiers injure their knees more often and snowboarders injure their wrists and shoulders more often. So what we have up here on the, on the slide here right now is the most common injury that can occur to your knee, which is an ACL injury. And if you, if you look right in here, this happens to be an MRI scan of a torn ACL right in here. And a snowboarder down at the bottom has a, more, uh, has a higher risk of dislocating their shoulder. And this is an x-ray of a dislocated shoulder. So we're going to spend a couple minutes going into these specific and more common ones than go into the, the severe ones. Now, this is the one you really want to avoid, the ACL tear. And why do you want to avoid that? Well, the ACL is the major stabilizing ligament in the center of your knee. And there's about 24 or 25,000 ACL tears per year that occur with skiing and snowboarding. And the ACL is a, a ligament right in the center of your knee. And I've got a little uh, model here that I use, but I think it's helpful. This is your thigh bone right here at the top, and this is your shin bone. And if you take your kneecap and pull it off, you're able to see that the ligament is the one that comes right through the center, and it helps prevent translation of your knee. So as I go through how this happens, you're gonna, I want you to understand where this ligament in, um, is in the center, so you'll understand why you can tear it with skiing or snowboarding. So if you're off balance to the rear, okay, and these, these are important. So if you're sliding backwards and your arms are getting behind you, your skis start to twist. And if that downhill ski gets stuck in some deep Sierra cement and twists, you know, 160 to 180 centimeters, that, that knee takes a moment like this. Your knee starts to twist. If it twists too far, that's when you can tear the, tear the ACL in the center. The other way you can get that is if you're jumping, and if you're jumping off a cliff, which you shouldn't be, or if you're jumping off something that's pretty high and you land with your knee all the way straight, again, that knee uh, absorbs a huge amount of energy through the stiff boots that are attached to the skis and then drives it up through the knee and can tear the ACL. The other thing that can occur more commonly in the knee with skiing and or snowboarding is a meniscus tear. We're gonna go back to the knee model for a moment just so that you can get a better idea. Inside the knee, between the femur bone and the tibia bone, 
is some cushioning cartilage caused, called the meniscus. So if you think about what this is right here, again, that same twisting motion can result in a tearing of the cartilage. Here's some pictures of the inside of the knee arthroscopically, where there's a normal cartilage and that's a torn cartilage. So if I say to you, if you unfortunately have this happen, if your knee looks like a torn piece of crab meat inside there and you feel like there's some crunching or crackling, that's what a meniscus tear looks like. This commonly occurs if you're sort of skiing in, uh, in moguls or, if you're, again, if you're in deep powder. So the same sort of mechanism occurs with the ACL, just a little less severe. Now, the ligament injury to the thumb is pretty unique to skiing, and these are actually my ski poles. Um, and there's a, very, there's a very important component to this that's missing. Does anybody know what's missing? The strap. Okay, the reason why the strap is missing is that's how you tear your, your, your ligament of your thumb, or skier's thumb is the ligament that's right here on the edge between your thumb and your, and your, your index finger. If your ski pole gets planted and twist, twisted as it gets stuck in the snow, you can injure that. As a surgeon, obviously, I can't afford to have my thumb get injured, so that's why I actually cut them off. I don't really see any reason to have straps on the poles anymore because these are a lot cheaper to replace than um, having surgery on your thumb if it, if it gets injured. Um, what I'd say to people is if you're falling, your poles are, are almost always going to hurt you more than help you, so get rid of them. You know, you don't want to throw them at the nearest snowboarder, but, um, you know, don't hang on to your poles because if you land on a hard pole or if your pole gets crushed between you and, and, a, and a piece of ice or something, you're going to lose. Moving on to shoulder injuries. Again, it can occur in skiers, but they're more common with snowboarders. And there's a variety of different things that can happen. Uh, you can dislocate your shoulder, you can tear your rotator cuff, or you can separate your shoulder. You may also break it, but we're going to go through the top three here. Just so, again, you understand what these common problems are. Again, not to scare you, but to sort of raise your awareness of what these uh, issues are. So the shoulder dislocation here is when your shoulder pops out of the socket. And how does that happen? Has anybody here dislocated their shoulder before? Okay. If you, you can do it by falling on your arm with an outstretched hand, or you can fall right on your shoulder or even on your elbow. Um, it's less common if you fall on the point of your shoulder than if you fall on your hand or your elbow. So what I normally recommend is you, you sort of get in a tuck and roll position because your, your body will better able to uh, absorb that big shock if you land on your shoulder than if you land on your hand because it may drive your shoulder out of its socket. Similarly, you can tear your rotator cuff. Now, your rotator cuff is a series of muscles that helps you raise your arm upward and outward. So you can imagine if you fall straight on your shoulder, you probably have a higher risk of injuring your rotator cuff than if you fall on your hand, but it can occur either way. And this is just some pictures, again, that can help maybe stimulate your brain a little bit about what this is. This is what a partial rotator cuff tear looks like, and this is after we've cleared or cleaned it up a little. Um, even if I tell you to fall right on the point of your shoulder, you increase your risk of a different type of injury, fortunately, which is less severe than those other two, and that's a shoulder separation. And that's where your collarbone uh, sort of disconnects from your, uh, your shoulder, and it, you can end up with a little swelling or a little uh, de uh, deformed area right up here. Most often, these, this last one doesn't result in surgery. Now, briefly, we should talk a little bit about how you're going to end up in the OR or how you're going to avoid this. The, the big ones to avoid are the ACL and the shoulder dislocation. Because more often than not, if you end up with one of those, especially if you're, you're a younger person and you have popped your shoulder out of place, you're going to end up with some instability. Or if you tear your ACL, you may be able to rehab yourself close to where you want to go, but you're not going to feel comfortable back on a slope without getting that surgically reconstructed. And that's anywhere from six months to a year to completely get back to it. Now, other things that can occur, and these are all real cases, by the way, that I've taken care of over the years are broken bones. Um, broken bones in, in skiing or snowboarding can be almost any one of them. The, the, the most common are the tibia or the shin bone, ankle fractures, wrist fractures, and a collarbone fracture. So if you look at this, this is what you don't want to have. All right, now, it, if you see where this, where this broke, it's right here. And if you think of how ski boots are now higher, that typically is what happens in a skier because the boot is stiff up until that point. And then if you fall forward and your skis don't release off the binding, or excuse me, your boots don't release off the binding, you sort of break your leg right at, like a toothpick right there at the edge. And then you end up with something like this in your, inside your knee, and this is a... Uh, intermedullary rod. The fractured ankle is much more common in the snowboarder than it is in the skier. 
for the same reason. When you're skiing, you, you basically have a cast on your leg. So you're not going to very likely uh, uh, break your ankle. But if you have a soft boot and an, uh, in, a, in a snowboarder, there's much more likely that you're going to have a little flex. And as you rotate around, you could end up with something like this. And this is what I call dumping the hardware drawer into the ankle, a bunch of screws in your ankle to put it back together. Wrist fractures. OK, who do you think has a higher risk of a wrist fracture, skiers or snowboarders? Snowboarders. Right. All right. So what happens is you fall. Again, you don't have the pole to hopefully prevent your fall. But when you fall and you hit some ice or some hard packed snow, you can uh, severely injure your wrist. Occasionally, we use something like an uh, external wrist, external fixator, which is what this is, to restore it. Collarbone fracture is common in either one. This is your collarbone right here, or also known as the clavicle. And similarly to that shoulder dislocation, if the force goes all the way up when you fall on your outstretched hand, you can end up with a collarbone fracture. If you're going to break something, this is what I suggest you break. Because the overwhelming majority of these do not need surgery, and they will go on to heal um, very nicely. Now, we do need to talk for a few minutes about the catastrophic injuries. And almost always occurs when you strike a fixed object at a high speed. Um, and the, the ones that are important to talk about to begin with are head and neck injuries, because these are the ones that you absolutely need to avoid. Uh, not all of them are avoidable, but there are some good, there's some good evidence to suggest that you can decrease your risk for some of these with some simple tips. The first of which is to understand how common it is. It's 5 to 10 or maybe even 15 percent of all skiing or snowboarding related injuries. So it's not a huge percentage, but they, they can result in like a concussion, which is just banging your head and feeling a little goofy all the way to ending up in a coma, um, to a spinal cord injury or even massive head trauma. So if you, if you think about the people, the famous people who have, who have died skiing, um, sort of the Kennedys or Steve or uh, Sonny Bonos, they're the ones who hit their heads hard on a tree. Um, and 16,000 of these occur per year in the United States. Now, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery and the Consumer Product Safety Commission, this isn't just my opinion, believe that about uh, 7,000 of those could either be prevented or reduced in severity by simply wearing a helmet. So I'm going to take a little poll. How many people wear a helmet in here? OK. Um, I've only been wearing one for two years, and I've been skiing for 20. So I think it's extraordinarily important that you consider that. Um, there's two reasons why. The data supports it. Two, it keeps you warm. And now it's becoming a little cooler. So abdominal injuries are another one. Who do you think gets abdominal injuries, skiers or snowboarders? It's more snowboarders than skiers. And the reason why is they, they're, they're up in the air more, uh, doing more aerial tricks. And then they can get their abdomen or their trunk uh, impacted by something, again, a fixed object. Plus, they're trying to jump over uh, rails or other, other types of things. So if you get hit in the stomach hard and you have persistent pain in your abdomen, um, especially if you feel like you have to vomit or something like that, you need to get checked out. Or if your kids who are skiing or snowboarding have abdominal pain the night after an injury, make sure they get checked out because a spleen or liver uh, rupture is something that they can um, actually die from, which is quite obviously severe. Uh, fatal injuries, as we talked about, are head trauma or chest trauma, um, and then heart attacks. Uh, it's, it's not something that the ski industry wants to really talk about, but if you have not been in shape and you think you're going to go to Tahoe or Colorado or Utah and go from being out of shape, not doing anything, to being at 10,000 feet skiing for six or eight hours, you're putting a lot of stress on your heart. So if you have any history of heart conditions, or if you're out of shape, make sure you take it easy to begin with to understand where you, where you can do and how much you can do. Um, and especially in kids here. And this is, a, this again, this whole lecture is trying to be based on literature, not just my opinion. The leading cause of death in kids is head trauma. Now, we're going to switch gears a little bit. We've talked about what the common injuries are. We've talked about what the very severe injuries are. Now I want to um, try to explain to you what are these causes, because the causes will lead us to some very specific prevention tips. And the causes are well known. Um, unlike other sports where sometimes you're trying to figure out why do you get injured or how do you get injured, the causes for ski injuries and snowboarding injuries are, are reasonably well delineated. Number one, aggressive skiing or boarding. That means going down a slope beyond your ability. It can also be, and peer pressure isn't just for the kids in their 15 to 18 year old zone. So you're 
35 or 40 and your buddies are better than you. And they say, well, let's go over here. You shouldn't do that if you don't feel comfortable doing it. That's how you get injured. You get nervous, you get your skiing or snowboarding technique breaks down, you get backwards, you're flailing, and then you injure yourself. Second thing is skiing or boarding too fast. I've got some friends who are phenomenal skiers. They ski in like Warren Miller films. I can't ever keep up with them. Every time I try to keep up with them, I think about this and I'm gonna end up hitting a tree or something. So don't go faster than your skills allow you to. And finally, uh, uh, for those boarders or skiers, if you're, if you're gonna jump, you gotta know how to land. And that's very important. Equipment problems. Who here checks their car before they go to Tahoe? Okay, you check your brakes, you make sure your oil's okay, your tires are okay. Here, who here checks their ski equipment? All right, you gotta think about your ski equipment like your car. You've got your skis on the top of your car, they've been sitting in the garage, they, you drive up through the ice and the snow in Tahoe. You have no idea what the conditions of the bindings are. You know, what's going on with your edges? Do your skis, do your feet fit in your boots? Things like that. Equipment issues are really the number two cause of skiing or snowboarding injuries. Also, be honest about your binding settings, especially for skiers. Um, if you set your bindings really high, you can go through the moguls hard and they won't come off. But if you aren't that super aggressive type three or three and a half or four skier, don't say that you are to the technician. Tell, be honest with them because you want your skis to release uh, if, you, uh, if, you, if you're in that situation. Because if your skis, again, get stuck in deep snow or in one of those moguls, you have a higher risk of injuring yourself. So check them out before you go. All right. This is one that we all tend to forget. Difficult weather conditions. Icy or variable slopes. So I was just up in Tahoe about three weeks ago and it was at 18 inches of snow, and then two days later, it was bright sunshine. And you may have all experienced this before. If you've been at Alpine, there's a big bowl, half of it's in the sun, half of it's in the, in the shade. So as you traverse across this slope, you're gonna come across all kinds of different conditions, mushy to icy to you know, Sierra cement. So watch out for variable slopes, especially here in California. Uh, for, for those of you who may have been to Utah, it's a little less variable, a little higher, a little lighter powder. I highly recommend it if you get a chance. Um, poor visibility. So this is an actual picture from about two weeks ago at Alpine Meadows. Um, and it was maybe an hour before that, it was bright sunshine. So it can be bright sunshine, fog, just be prepared for diff differing conditions. Uh, and then man-made snow has been correlated with higher risk of uh, skiing or snowboarding related injuries because, it, again, it's a little more granular, a little icier. The final one is the one that we can actually do something about beforehand. Uh, it's the end of, end of January right now, but I don't think it's too late to, to get in, in good shape to go skiing, even if you're planning one for three or four weeks from now or even next week. If you are out of shape, you do have a higher risk of injuring yourself. Your balance isn't as good or you're going to get fatigued sooner. Um, and you, you may end up with too much aerobic activity or cold exposure like we talked about for people with a heart condition. So some specific tips, and then we're going to go into a, um, an exercise regimen that I do myself, and I'm, I welcome the opportunity to learn from you as well. Um, but some very specific injury prevention tips, and then we're going to go into what I call damage control tips. So if you in, do injure yourself, what to do. Um, get in shape. Um, think about this back in November or December. It can really help you be prepared. Check your equipment before you go to the mountain like you check your car. Wear sunscreen, okay? I can't emphasize that enough because those days when you think it's snowing outside and then halfway through the day it starts getting nice, you can end up getting fried out there. So be very careful. It's very, very dangerous. When you start in the mountain, who, who warms up at all? Okay, so avoid the guy or gal who says, let's go to the top of KT-22 at Squaw and go right off the top, okay? Take a couple cruiser runs, see how you feel. And also, I recommend you do a little stretching um, beforehand. And we're going to demonstrate some stretching uh, that you can do in the car or, or just as you get to the mountain. Uh, rest when you're tired. It's always the last run of the day that I hear. Well, I was the last run of the day, and I uh, fell and twisted my knee, and that's how I injured it. Don't go off marked trails. So if you see one of these signs up there, um, you know, don't, don't try and be cute and get away with it. Hydrate on the mountain. Uh, you see, I see a lot more people who are wearing 
of those camelbacks are trying to drink more. You're at altitude, you are uh, expiring more air that can be, uh, you can lose a lot of hydration. But avoid drinking too much on the mountain. <laughs> okay, save, save drinking or a lot of drinking for after or après ski. Um, now, specific skier or snowboarder tips. So for skiers, it's important to keep your balance at all times, ski in control, and as I say, wear a helmet. Um, choose your terrain according to your ability. Um, don't let your ego get in the way uh, of being safe. So if, if you think you can go down this slope safely, great. If you can't, ask, <laughs> ask somebody to show you a different way or a safer way to get down. You'll uh, potentially avoid coming to see me in the office. And, and finally, for, for skiers, it's very important to keep your upper body kind of quiet and in control. I've heard uh, ski instructors say, keep your hands in front of you kind of like a race car driver. Because you can imagine, as you get your hand behind you, you start to get off balance. So if you're forward on your skis and your hands are in front of you and your upper body is in control, you're less likely to get your skis crossed or going different directions, and that's when you can end up injuring yourselves. For the boarders out there, I want you to ride the mountain in control. So just be careful and, and choose your, your pathway. If you're going to do any sort of uh, consistent snowboarding, there's really good evidence to suggest you should wear wrist guards. Um, I actually ask you, how many snowboarders out there? Okay. So how many people wear wrist guards? All right, excellent. Um, there's mounting evidence to suggest that you would decrease the severity of a wrist fracture if you did fall on your wrist or maybe even prevent it altogether. And absolutely wear a helmet if you're going to do what this guy is doing right here. So when I, when I say avoid big air tricks if you don't know how to land and make sure you pick your spot before you jump. Uh, more skiers are getting into these terrain parks too. So I think we're, we're going to see a problem where two very different styles of attacking the mountain end up in the same area and can end up with a problem. So let's say you do fall, okay? Uh, you you want to be careful as you're falling. Uh, if you can keep your knees close to your body, keep your knees bent, you're going to have less risk of an injury. Uh, and again, don't jump off something if you don't know how to land, but keep in that sort of race car tight athletic position and you're, you're less likely to injure yourself. If you start to slide down a steep slope, don't try and stand up. Don't try and, you've seen those skier videos where the guy makes a big crash and all of a sudden he pops up and he's cruising on down. Well, that may be you, but it isn't me. So you want to dig your poles in if you still have them. Dig your elbows in, dig your, your skis in, or excuse me, dig your boots in if your skis have popped off. Stop or arrest your slide, okay? That's the number one tip you can have if you're on a steeper slope. Uh, and then keep your eye out for fixed objects. If you have to slide to get around a tree or a pole, absolutely do it. Because if you're going pretty fast and you hit that tree or pole, uh, you are going to lose. And that could be a very severe injury, as we talked about. Uh, now, when you're down and hurt, stay down and wait for help. Don't ski or board unless you know you're safe. And I'll tell you a true story of a friend of mine and I were at Snow, uh, Snowbird in Utah. This is maybe four or five years ago. And we're right up at the top, something called the Cirque. And it's very steep and very icy. And we all think we know what we're doing. And we go through this mogul field, and he goes down. And he hits his head. And this is back before he or I were wearing helmet, so another reason to wear a helmet. He hits his head pretty hard. He's down for about a minute or so, and I'm checking him out. He seems okay, and I said, are you right? He said, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. He takes off like a bullet. Goes about mid-mountain, mid I finally catch up with him, and I said, are you all right? He goes, I am fine. Gets all the way down to the base, and I said, well, let me just ask you a few questions. You know, I'm trying to play pseudo-doctor here. This is a good friend of mine, and I said, listen, let me ask you a few questions to figure out whether we should go in and get you checked out. I said, let's start with the basic one. Where are we? He goes, would you leave me alone? We're at Squaw. And I said, we're going in, OK? Because <laughs> he, he really thought he was in California, and he really thought he was at Squaw. And he had had you know, a concussion, and he ended, up, he ended up being fine. But if you do hit your head, be careful. Make sure you get checked out, because you can actually injure your neck and not know it. Um, and then listen to the ski patrol. That's what they're there for. They really are very good at trying to help you. They're not there to. To, you know, just they're not going to charge you anything, though, but they want to make, you, make sure you're getting off the mountain in a safe way. So if they want to take you down in a sled, let them do it. And if you injure your knee or your shoulder badly enough that it swells up and you feel like it's a little wobbly or you can't move it, get somebody to help you down. You don't want to turn something minor into something major. Uh, and, and plenty of people are around all those mountains to help you. 
So final tips, not all accidents um, are avoidable. Have fun, but be, be smart and careful. And anybody know where this is? No, well, nothing, that's just the top of Alpine. But that's on, one of those, that's on the same day, by the way, where it turned into uh, that foggy condition. Now, for a few seconds here, what I want to do is go over a very specific conditioning program that I personally do. We are very uh, lucky to have a, a friend of mine who's a yoga instructor here tonight who's going to show you in ways that I can't bend how to do some of these maneuvers. Um, but if you want to get ready for skiing or snowboarding, you should have a flexibility plan in place, aerobic and anaerobic conditioning, as well as core strengthening. And it's just something you need to be consistent about. If you can go six to eight weeks um, before you want to go out, that's great. But even if you have one or two weeks, I think you would improve enough to be, be useful. So I call this the Power Knee Conditioning Program. Again, it has yoga moves for flexibility, stretches and use of a bike or a wall sit for aerobic and anaerobic conditioning, and then core stability exercises such as crunches and a stork stand. So for those of you who practice yoga out there, no laughing at me. This is the best I can do, but uh, for somebody at my advanced age, it's not terrible. But the, the goal here it, with the downward dog in a yoga move is to try and work on uh, a variety of different things. But as you can see, I've got a problem with tight hamstrings. So that's, that's not a tumor over there. That's my actual lateral hamstring. <laughs> and that's preventing me from, fortunately, you can't tell, but my heels are not all the way on the ground. That's one, one maneuver, and I'm going to leave it a little bit to Giselle to go over the specifics of why I think these, these motions or these moves are, are good for you. Another one is a simple trunk twist where you're trying to open up your lower back and also working a little bit on your um, lower extremity flexibility. For me, my hamstring and my piriformis, are, which is a muscle in, in your hip area, are very tight, and I find this one to be very, very helpful for skiing. So I do this the morning of, uh, just when I'm getting on my ski clothes. Um, and I think it can help you open up just a little bit before you go. Now, what I call the power knee program is something I've developed for my patients that they, they do after knee arthroscopies or people who have something called patellofemoral pain, mild knee pain or mild front pain. And it can, it's composed of three stretches and then the use of an exercise bike to help improve your, your strength and, and flexibility of your knee. The quad stretch in a doorway, which you see here, is, is the first one, and I recommend a set of 10, and you hold it for 20 seconds each time. A hamstring stretch, and almost every one of you has tight hamstrings. Maybe not as tight as me, but have tight hamstrings. This is a simple one that you can do anywhere, and, and essentially what you do is you stand as tall as you can, put your, your leg up on a, a table or a chair, and then you hinge at your waist. You notice I'm not hinging at my neck or my head, but hinging at my waist, and again, there's that super tight hamstring down there. The Achilles stretch is a, a third one, similar, just pushing up against the wall. Uh, by the way, all these exercises are up on the website that you see down here in the corner. Um, so if you have any questions, you can go to that and just click on the Power Knee um, program, and it's all right there for you. Uh, this is the one that I do with almost all of my patients with knee pain. Um, and it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty boring, so I recommend using an iPod or something else. But it's very effective and very safe uh, for people who have you know, any, almost any form of knee pain, but also people who want to get in condition for skiing, I think it's very valuable. Five minutes of a warm-up, 10 minutes of moderate effort, 10 minutes of significant effort, and then 10 minutes of, or excuse me, five minutes of a cool down. Uh, several of my patients are not using it for weight reduction, but they'll measure the calories that they can burn in about a half an hour to evaluate their overall effort, and then they keep a log. So if you can do 250 calories in a half hour this week, go for 275 the next week. And that'll help motivate you to keep going. If you can't get to an exercise bike, the wall sit or wall slide is a classic ski or snowboard, in, or snowboard um, exercise. And it's simply uh, sitting up against a wall and sliding down into a seated position, holding it. You can either hold it for a set of 10 for 20 seconds, or you can go for a maximum of maybe two or three minutes if you really get to be good. For some core stability, I recommend crunches with your legs at 90 degrees. You can do a set, two sets of 15 to 20. And then finally, for balance, I recommend doing something called a stork stand. That's essentially standing on one leg and keeping your knee bent uh, at about 20 or 30 degrees and trying to maintain perfect balance. You can watch yourself in a mirror, but you'll find that your, your hip or your pelvis may dip one way or the other, and you want to keep your, your pelvis level. So this is, these are, I know I, th I went through that pretty fast, but again, all that's up on the website. What I'd like to do now is, is take advantage of the fact that we have an expert in our midst, 
uh, on, on yoga instruction. I, I, as an orthopedic surgeon, I really would like to endorse yoga as something you could do to improve your flexibility and your core strength. And tonight isn't about trying to give you some sort of comprehensive program, but I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Giselle Mari, who's an instructor here in, in the uh, Mid Peninsula. She's also appeared in uh, Yoga Journal Magazine, and she's my personal yoga instructor. So thank you for coming tonight. And uh, if you can show us a few of the things that you've shown me and explain sure. to them in ways that I can't, why they're, why they're valuable. Okay, um, there are a few of the poses that Alan was showing you in his presentation that I'd like to actually use someone from the audience. Um, Amy, if you could come on up so that you can see what a downward dog looks like, a twist, and I'll add another component to it so we can get a little bit into the adductor muscles as well. Um, and then we'll do a piriformis stretch. And all of these poses, by the way, you can do on a chair if sitting down is a little bit difficult for you because of tight hamstrings or hips or perhaps a low back problem. So at first, we're gonna start with the downward dog. So I'm gonna have her come onto her hands and knees at first, which is a really good way to start in this pose. She's gonna curl her toes under, and all I'm gonna have her do is keep her knees bent. She's just gonna lift her sit bones up and back as if she's pushing the floor away from her. She's elongating through her spine. She's hinging at her hips. And you get a really nice stretch in the hamstrings as well as elongation in the spine. And because you're doing a little bit of weight bearing, you're also building the deltoids in the arm as well as strengthening through your shoulders. So there's a lot of components to this pose. We could spend an hour at least on this pose, but we won't. Um, but certainly there's a lot of benefit to it as well. A lot of people will get a nice calf stretch as well as Achilles depending on what your flexibility is. So you can go ahead and come back down onto your knees. And then from here, I'm gonna have her go into the twist that Alan had done in his presentation. So she's gonna sit on the floor. She's gonna bring her left leg underneath her so that the foot's just to the outside of her right hip. You want both sit bones to be level and seated on the floor. So just like Alan was saying, even in the balance poses in your core, you want your hips to be nice and level. She's gonna bend her leg up and over that thigh She's gonna take her right hand behind you and she's gonna sit nice and tall and elongate her spine so that her core and her whole front body is lifted. She's gonna inhale this left arm up and then exhale into her twist and take the elbow to the outside of her knee. This is gonna help with low back and for some people you'll actually get an external rotator opening or an outer hip opening as well as getting through the front body and opening up through the heart. And the shoulders just need to be relaxed. And again, this is a pose that can be broken down infinitum, but we won't do that tonight. What's also really nice about this pose is a counter stretch. So after you've taken this about five breaths or six breaths, depending on where you're at, you can counter stretch the pose by then taking the left hand behind you, sliding the right arm down to the inside of your leg and keeping that same length and elongation through the front body while still keeping both the sit bones rooted. Okay, so you wanna keep that stability. From here, I'm gonna have her come into what we call a cobbler pose. So she's gonna bring the soles of her feet together. It's a little tricky when you have heels on, but you'll get the idea. <laughs> You're gonna take, typically you would take the thumbs under the balls of the feet and open up the soles of your feet, which will actually help get into the groin a little bit deeper. And you're gonna bring your heels a little bit closer in towards your pubic symphysis or pubic bone area. The knees will bend out to the side. And again, if you have knee issues, I want you to just be patient with it, take your time, don't force the pose. You'll take a deep, long inhale. She'll elongate her body here, and then she's gonna hinge right at her hips and forward fold, still keeping the chest open and the heart open. And that's gonna get nicely into the groins and to the adductors, mildly speaking. Of course, you can do a straddle pose to get a little bit deeper than that, but we won't do that tonight. So that's a nice stretch to do as well. And then finally, we're going to do um, kind of an external rotator hip or an outer hip stretch, which can get into the piriformis a little bit, again, depending on your flexibility. So I'm gonna have her come to the chair. And we're just gonna have her cross her left leg right over her right, so we do this all the time. And this is actually really effective in a plane too if you have a little bit of room. The key here is to flex this foot. So Alan talked about the meniscus and sometimes we're tearing the meniscus and doing some of these moves. This also applies in yoga, so anatomically speaking, once you flex that foot, you actually open up the knee a little bit to protect the meniscus so there's nothing pressing up against it. From here, all she would do is, again, sit nice and tall, hinging at the hips and gently forward folding. 
Now for her, she may not feel this because she's pretty open in her hips, but she might feel the sensation through the hamstring and the high hamstring right at the attachment here. How's that feel? Feels good. good? Yeah. And it does feel good, so it's all about feeling good. Okay? okay. So that pretty much covers um, some of the things that he had talked about, Alan had talked about in his presentation. Certainly we could go on about at least 30 other poses and be more comprehensive in our stretching opening up shoulders, st uh, stabilizing shoulders and strengthening them, but for the most part, I just wanted to cover something really basic so that you could take at least one or two poses home with you. Okay? All right. So I think that's it. Thanks, yeah. Amy. Thank you, Giselle. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to finish up now with some questions, and I'll, I'll make it a little interactive here, but what they just showed you I think is an excellent, easy warm-up to do before. If you spent five or ten minutes as you're putting on your ski or snowboarding clothing and you do some of these maneuvers, you're going to have just that little bit more flexibility when you get out there and a little bit better warm-up, which may prevent you from having an injury. So um, I'll open it up now to uh, any questions that anybody may have, and we'll start right over here. And the question is, if you can't do a downward dog because your wrists have some tendonitis, what options may you have? You, ha you do have a couple of options, and again, it just depends on the severity of your circumstance. You could utilize a chair so there's a little less weight on your arms here, or you can grab to the outside of the chair and just stretch this way, obviously with the chair stable so that you're not sliding, where well, you can still get a nice stretch in the back as well as into the hamstrings, and it'll be a little less stressful on the actual wrists. The other option is to actually move down onto your forearms. So if you're here, you take the forearms to the floor, curl the toes under, and again, still lifting. It's a little bit more on the shoulders, and it does require a little bit more strength in the shoulders, but it's a nice alternative because now what you're doing is you're distributing the weight through the forearms and still opening up the hands so that you keep the weight all throughout. And you can still get a nice stretch that way as well. And I'm living proof that you can start where you can't even bend at 80 degrees to, to doing a better downward dog. And it is very helpful. Right. I think maybe if you can show them the one we talked about where you're standing, the piriformis stretch where you're standing like yeah. this. This is an excellent one. The stork stand, which I showed you at the end, which is a pretty, this is a classic physical therapy, and I know we have some physical therapists here. Uh, 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 that's the one I would start with, where you just stand on one leg, and you bend your knee, and you can slightly lean forward, and you can actually see if somebody can push on you a little bit to see whether or not you're gonna uh, fall. But I think another one, which Giselle can do better than I can, is, is trying to see how you do in this particular uh, area. You're gonna stretch your piriformis, and then just try and stand steady. The best thing I tell my patients also is to, to look in the mirror. You may think you're super stable, but if you're swaying one way or another, you're definitely going to be off balance. And maybe you can, show, you can demonstrate it much better than I can. So I'll show you the, uh, the piriformis stretch that you can do. There's also um, core work that's really important yep. in assisting with your balance. And that can include a stork stand. There's other stands that, that are done in yoga or other types of calisthenics that you can do to help stabilize the core as well as doing traditional crunching to strengthen this area as well as your back. So you wanna make sure that both your core and your back is balanced because we have a tendency of wanting to get abs of steel and then we forget about our back and the back is quite weak and then we find that we're still kind of unstable. So the pose that, I, that Alan was talking about is this piriformis stretch which Amy actually presented on the chair which is really effective. This gets a little bit deeper into it. So again, you're crossing the leg over one. I'm flexing my foot you would sit back. I'm using a chair because again, if you have a weak core, you want to start to start, or you want to start from the beginning, stabilizing, still getting that stretch. And then as you feel more comfortable, you can start to balance here and rest. And that's going to help you as well with the skiing or with the snowboarding. And especially for skiing, excellent skiing is essentially one leg at a time. So that's why that one in particular is good because you need to have one legged balance, not not two-legged balance as much as one-legged balance for skiing as, as you alternate between the two. The question is, if you've had an ACL tear and repaired or fixed, should you wear a brace? Well, let's talk about, just for a second, 
the literature. There is no great literature to support using a brace. If you have a really high energy injury after an ACL reconstruction, your brace is not proven to prevent you from tearing it again. So we have to separate sort of psychology from reality. Some people will want to wear a brace, and I say wear a brace maybe for the first year or two afterwards to help them remember that they have an ACL tear, and I think that helps maybe prevent them from, from doing something a little too crazy, but there's no great evidence. What I highly recommend to my patients, and I do not prescribe um, what, what are sort of functional ACL braces, get a good physical therapist who can create an internal brace. Internal brace meaning you've got the balance all the way back to the good core strengthening, uh, and that'll help prevent you from re-injuring it. And by the way, what Giselle and I are talking about, core strengthening has been shown to decrease your risk of lower extremity injury. So it's not just building your quad, but it's building your whole balance. So if you, if you have a good physical therapist, uh, they will not just work on knee exercises with you. And you may wonder, well, why am I doing other things? Well, it's because if your core is stable, your lower extremities will be more stable. So uh, I've had several friends who've had ACL braces, and I tell them to work on your knee more. Get your knee so strong that you're confident with it, and you won't need the brace. The, the exercise bike is way underutilized uh, as, a, as a therapy tool and as a preparation tool. And the difference is, with, with a Stairmaster, you, you really aren't getting the same sort of uh, muscle groups that are worked in a bike in a very uh, safe manner. You can also, in a, in a bike, really crank it up to the point where you can exhaust yourself without putting yourself at any risk. Um, so I, I, I wish I could design a bike that was, was cool and sexy and fun to ride. Maybe if there's somebody out there in the area who knows a designer for me, I'd be happy to work with them. But I think the bike gets everything you need to get in a single tool. It works your quads, it works your hamstrings, it works your gluteal muscles, but you also get an excellent aerobic and anaerobic benefit if you do it in a, in a specific way. And what I recommended here and what's up on the website is essentially riding up a hill. So we live in a beautiful place to go cycling. If you've ever been cycling outside here and if you try to ride up to Skyline and back, it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good workout. And that's how I came up with that particular format. You want to find a little bit of a flat area to warm up in. You want to find a moderate slope to, to challenge yourself. And then you want to have an area where you are very challenged for 10 or 15 minutes. And then you want to have a cool down period. And you'll find that you're going to, the, the muscle building occurs physiologically by stressing it. So you've got to continually stress your body or it adapts to whatever you're doing. So what I tell my patients is, once it becomes too easy for you, you've got to increase the resistance. And so if I'm looking at a patient who's recovering from an ACL or a knee surgery, I have yet to see somebody severely injure themselves on a bike. Um, they don't fall off. They can, they can monitor. They can also get off, and they're not 10 miles away if they're riding outside. So check it out for a month, and it, it, I, I think you'll find it to be more valuable than the Stairmaster. Any difference between the recumbent and an upright bike? Very simple but important difference. With a, with a recumbent bike, you're sitting down and pedaling, and you aren't working what's called your iliopsoas or your hip flexor muscle, whereas an upright bike, you constantly are um, lifting. And, and why is that important? Well, when you step up to step on a stair, what are you using? You're not using your quad very much, but you're using your hip flexor muscle. So uh, upright bike, 30 minutes, three to four times a week. I'll, I'll call it the fountain of youth. And I do, I do this myself, too. Skiing is definitively more challenging on the knees because there's a dramatically increased risk of injuring your knees uh, with skiing versus snowboarding. It's almost two-thirds, one-third in each one of those. So if you're going to injure yourself two-thirds of the time with a skier, you're going to injure your lower extremities. And with a snowboarder, it's two-thirds of the time you're going to injure your upper extremities. So you have to kind of pick what's, what's uh, important to you. I, I tried snowboarding a few times. and. <laughs> First of all, I wasn't very good at it, and Giselle's laughing because she was probably there. But uh, I also can't afford to injure my arms. I have a, if I injure my arms and my wrists, I'm in trouble from a professional standpoint. If I injure my knee, it's less likely that I would be more disabled. But knees, much 
more likely with skiers than snowboarders. Good question. Is what to do with your upper extremities? Is that the question? No, it, we, we presented mainly lower extremities. Your lower extremity core and core are more important to prevent because you're going to Th those affect your balance. Your upper extremities haven't been shown dramatically to decrease your injuries, but it's important more for techniques. <laughs> What's the best way to fall on a snowboard? Um, you have to pick your poison. The, again, I'm not an experienced snowboarder, but it doesn't seem like you have a lot of time. At least from skiing, you can flail around a little bit and pick your poison. I think you need to, before you fall, have an idea, and this is why this is an important question, how you're going to do that. Tuck and roll. Okay? Tuck your head in, tuck your arms in. Do not fall on your outstretched arm. Okay? It's a natural tendency for us to put our arm out. But your wrist and your hand do not have a lot of cushioning compared to your shoulders. Um, so if you, if, if you bring your arms in and you tuck your head, you're less likely to injure something. Um, and try to take the impact with your shoulder if you can. Um, if you break your arm or you dislocate your shoulder, we have a great chance of putting it back together. If you hit your head or you hit your abdomen hard against something, there's a chance you could have a catastrophic injury. So get into that fetal position. The question is if you have some sort of misalignment of your leg or of your, specifically of your kneecap, should you do something to try and realign that? Absolutely. Whether it's with some form of manipulation or what I call internal physiologic manipulation, strengthening one thing that, and releasing another. So IT band tendonitis is very common in runners. Uh, if you rehab uh, in an improper way, you could build the outside part of your leg versus the inside. So you may need to uh, sort of stretch your IT band and build the inside part of your leg. You should also look at your feet. Okay, there's a whole industry of footbeds for skiers. I mean, you can spend a couple hundred bucks realigning your feet to make sure your feet are in the right area. So those of you who have really flat feet, that may be important so that you don't stress the inside part of your knee. Uh, when you're skiing because you're going to be putting a lot of pressure on the inside part of your foot and if it's already flat it could it could make it worse so good question the question is how quickly can you get back to snowboarding after you've dislocated your shoulder uh, I, I would put the minimum on that as probably about a month there are harnesses that you can wear uh, that I've actually put on some friends of mine uh, that pre prevent you or restrict you from bringing your arm out to your side Depending on how severe the injury was, um, you can get back, I would think, within three or four weeks, but I would probably put you in something like a harness that restricts your motion so that it, it's less likely that your arm's going to come out again.